Um, it comes from Nehemiah 4 today. But from that day on, only half of my workers continued in the construction, while the other half held the spears, shields, bows, and body armor. Meanwhile, the leaders positioned themselves behind the whole house of Judah who were building the wall. The carriers did their work with a load in one hand and a weapon in the other. The builders built with swords fastened in their belts, and the trumpeters stayed by their side. When I said, then I said to the officials, the officers, and the rest of the people, the work is very spread out, and we are far apart from each other along the wall. When you hear the trumpet sound, come and gather where we are. Our God will fight for us. So we continued to work, with half of them holding spears from dawn until dusk. I also said to the people at the time, let every man and his servant spend the night in Jerusalem so that we can guard during the day during the night and work during the day. Neither I nor my relatives, nor my servants, nor my bodyguards took off our clothes, even when they sent for water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Chris Bryant, the senior pastor. Thank you so much for being in worship with us uh, this weekend. How many of you were here last weekend? Raise your hand. Perfect attendance for you this year. How about that? For the rest of you, I'll give you a mulligan. For whatever power is in me, I offer it to you. Take a mulligan. You have perfect attendance as well. Now keep it going, all right? Keep it going. Um, this is the weekend, believe it or not, statistically speaking, that people give up. Sometime between the, second, the ending of the second week of the new year and the beginning of the second week of the, the second month, people give up. And, and so right about now, an awful lot of folks have decided to quit on 2019. It's like, it's just not worth it. It's just not going to happen this year, you know? And I don't want that to be you. And I don't think it is you, in part because you're here today. I, I want you to thrive. And the way we thrive is not necessarily by wishing things were different or hoping things are different or depending upon circumstances to change because circumstances often don't change. Sometimes they even get worse. So thriving has to be something else. And last week we suggested that we begin by taking inventory. We decide what's really important and that's part of our spirituality as Christians. Part of our spirituality is to ask God to help us really evaluate, and not just it being a first step towards transformation or, or getting a goal met, that's something that's truly important to us in our lives, but, but as part of our spirituality, asking what's most important and then deciding what's most important is, in fact, part of our regular spirituality. It's part of how we live out our faith. And then we express it in different words and different phrases and different biblical verses. Take, take for example, this, uh, this verse from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. It, if I might paraphrase it, it essentially says, you know, examine yourselves, right? Take inventory. Examine yourselves. Unless you fail, you're afraid that you'll fail the test. That's part of our spirituality. What is most important? A lot of people never decide. They wish what is most important. But they don't decide. They don't take the time to really ask. And let me just remind you, as I did last week, time is running out. I mean, all of us experience this at some point, right? We, we, we run out of time. Where is time running out for you? That's another way of framing it. Is it in maybe trying to save your marriage? Is time running out in how much influence you have? over your children in the way you believe they should go? Is time running out on your education before college? Is time running out on your ability to 
be the grandpa or grandmother that you want to be? Where's time running out? Is, are you, is time running out on your health, right? I mean, sometimes I, I, I feel like, well, you know, I'm not that old, but I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> Better get started today. And that's where we find ourselves. Taking inventory, deciding what's most important is that first, first key step. And for the Christian, it's an ongoing step. It's an ongoing part of our spirituality. But here's the thing. If we don't then transition into what's the plan, well, that's another signal. That's another signal that we didn't really have a goal. We just have a wish. As a matter of fact, any plan or any goal, rather, that doesn't have a plan is just a glorified wish. Right? And so hopefully you have some resolutions. Hopefully you have some ideas, uh, some, some hopes, some dreams, some aspirations on how 2019 needs to be different, could be different, should be different. I mean, I'm not telling you what those priorities should be. I'm asking you to consider it for yourselves. And those of us that are, are putting our faith into it, we're using our spirituality to, this, to say, God, help us. Decide what's really most important right now. What do I need? To, I mean, because life's not going to change. It's going to be just as busy and just as problematic. As a matter of fact, it could get worse. I really need to think about what's most important. And then I've got to make a plan. You've got to make a plan. And it's a daily plan. It's not just a big idea. It's a daily plan. Listen, we live into the life we want to live one day at a time. You know, there's a lot of brilliance in the sermon. Afterwards, you're going to go home about three hours from now. You're like, you know, he really didn't say much today. But, but, <laughs> but I want you to really think about it. This is, these, are, these are moments when we have to sober up, you might say. I used that phrase last week, I think, as well. We live into the life we want to lead one day at a time. We don't run out for milk. And in the midst of grabbing the extra gallon of milk that we needed, discover on the way back, I finally am living the life. We don't roll out of bed in the morning and think, wow, finally, I knew this day would come. I woke up, and I have the life I want. I mean, this just, that just doesn't happen. We live into the life we want to lead one day at a time. And so it's important for you to ask right now, taking inventory, what's most important, deciding what's most important, what really needs to be, continuing to ask that question, and then, rather than just getting a big idea or several priorities, saying, now what's the plan? Here's the next really <clears throat> brilliant statement that you'll hear today. This one's great. This one probably should be on bumper stickers, right? Here it is. Tomorrow is not today. I know, genius. I'm seeing t-shirts. We can make money. Tomorrow is not today. Now, Obviously, I'm being tongue-in-cheek, but I, I think you identify with this, right? I mean, it, it's so easy for us to think about tomorrow. I mean, we have a grand idea, or we have reprioritized, or we've got these things that we really want to walk, work on, because this is what's really important. This relationship is really important, or growing spiritually is really important, or getting out of debt is really important, or, or getting healthy is really important, or spending more quality time with the kids. I mean, it's really, I mean we have it, right? But then life happens, and it's so easy for us to just think, well... Tomorrow. I, I know what I need to do, and I'll get started tomorrow. Now, <clears throat> let me back up for a second and just share with you, we're not going to be Pharisees about this. We're not going to be legalistic, and I don't want you. There are, there are perfectly appropriate times when out of good emotional health and even perhaps spiritual wisdom, you say, no, I need to rest. I need to just relax. It's going to be okay. Tomorrow will be fine. And there's truth in that. What I'm talking about, though, today are not those moments, but rather those things in your life that you have for a while now probably been thinking that are really important or need to be, and it keeps getting put off. That's what I'm talking about. Tomorrow is not today. And it always moves on you. I've noticed this. Do you have this problem? I think I'll get to it tomorrow. And I wake up the next day, and tomorrow's moved. I think, it's today again. <laughs> but you get the point, don't you? It's just the way it is. That's the way life is. Now, some of us have that problem because we're procrastinators, right? I mean, that's kind of our natural default. Maybe, maybe we can be lazy at times or just kind of self-absorbed. Some of us have the problem that we're just so busy. We have a lot of responsibilities. 
And it's very, very difficult to do anything we want to do to make any kind of changes. And, and some of us are just a mixed bag of all that. But the thing is, we only have today. Today is the day of salvation. This is the good news. We believe, we Christians believe in a God of an eternal now, an eternal now. Today is always the day of salvation. Good day, bad day, awful day, lots of problems, no problems. Today is the day of salvation. Thank God it wasn't yesterday. That'd be a really not very happy gospel. Yesterday was the day of salvation. And it's not tomorrow. Tomorrow will be the day of salvation. I mean, that's sort of good news. At least you can look. But, but it's to, no, it's today. Always today. Now, here's, uh, you know, I've been tongue-in-cheek and made you laugh a little bit. But, but here's, I think, the wisdom of the Scripture, the way the Scripture reads, is this. So teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. Um, one of the things that helped me snap out of tomorrow thinking when I need to is realizing tomorrow won't be enough either. Now, maybe it's just me and that's my melancholic personality and you think you're incredibly negative, Chris. But, but that helps me nonetheless. Not because I'm being negative, it's just I kind of, again, sober up and realize, you know what, even if tomorrow's a perfect day, even if I do everything I want, and I go to the gym, and I'm really working on my health, and I'm exercising, and I eat perfectly, it's not going to happen tomorrow. I'm not going to be all of a sudden that night like, wow, my whole new wardrobe, I'm ready. <laughs> right? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. I don't, and so I think about that. I say, even if tomorrow's perfect, I, won't, I still won't get there. So why don't I just go ahead and do something today? Why don't I just go ahead and do something today? It's not going to be perfect either. But let me just do something. And you know what? Tomorrow, I'll do what I did today. And that is just some, at least something. And that starts working. That starts working for us. The plan may not go perfectly. It may not even go well. But if we're thinking tomorrow, then, the ta- then, then today, the plan doesn't go at all. The scriptures, again... And just leave that slide up. But the scripture reads, again, let me just remind you as you're looking at that slide, that the scripture reads, so teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. We may get a heart of wisdom. Today is the 15,499th day of my life. And that's accurate, including leap years, quarter days, all that kind of stuff. I'm that much of a nerd. (laughs) Now, I didn't just do that for the sermon. The uh, staff can testify to this, that uh, I actually had this idea and was thinking about these sorts of things back in October when it was like 15,415th day, I think, uh, when I shared it with them. But you, it's kind of powerful to realize how many days you've lived. And for me to realize today is the 15,499th day of my life, and there's not anything, anything at all I can do about 15,498 days that have preceded it, and I'm not even promised tomorrow. So what am I going to do today? So teach us to number our days that we might get a heart of wisdom. The plan may not go perfectly. It may not even go well. But if it's always tomorrow, then whatever our plan is, it's not going to go at all. Now, the scripture that we're reading, we're using for the series comes from Nehemiah. It's an interesting book. I haven't preached on the Old Testament since I've been here since uh, June, so I wanted to do that. It's part of my idea. And so, Nehemiah is the 16th book of the Bible. You begin with uh, the law, the Torah, the Pentateuch, that is the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And then you move into the section that we Christians call the history section of the Bible. It's a bit of a misnomer, because it's not for the sake of history. It has more to do with the salvation history, or God's mighty acts in creating and forming the people of Israel, and then how that came apart. And you begin with Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. And then it actually ends with Esther. I failed to mention that last week. And I, I kind of did, a, I think, a pretty good summary of the Old Testament in about two minutes. I'll, I'll let you listen to that sermon if you didn't catch it. What I'll simply share today is Nehemiah is trying to rebuild Jerusalem because it's a ghost town. And it's hard for us, I think, to identify because... 
while we understand rebuilding cities and stuff, this is, it's not about that. It's about the spirituality. And so what I related it to last week, and I want to do it again today, is the tornado in 2011. And many of us know that our sisters and brothers across the way at Mount Peria, their facility was completely demolished. And, and what I'd like you to imagine is, what if it never got rebuilt? What if in its place there were just the ruins of what the tornado did? And maybe occasionally we would see somebody put up a tent where they'd have something going on over there. Or we'd see people gather when the weather permitted. And how would that make you feel? I mean, wouldn't there be something that would start to stir on you with, like, we gotta go, we gotta go help them. We gotta go build, right? Not because you believe that God is contained in that, but there's a sense of priority there, the need. Nehemiah is feeling this. Jer- Jerusalem is the very center of the Jewish universe. And, and, and God's people are not thriving, they're surviving. In fact, if you read in the Old Testament, there's incredible language that talks about how the glory of the Lord, the holiness of God was, was in the city and in the temple, and, and it departs before the destruction. And, and, and so Nehemiah's called to go back and, and do something. He sees what's most important. He takes inventory. He decides this is what we got to do, and then he comes up with a plan, and it is, in fact, the daily plan. That's what Nehemiah is really famous for, that book of the Bible. is famous for how the people kind of get their act together, those who are there, and Jerusalem, it doesn't get completely rebuilt, but it, it gets into the position of ongoing building in the future, something that's not possible in the state it's in then. And so that's where we turn. And what we read today is Nehemiah's daily plan for the people. And the success that he has in the plan accounts to three things. He, he helps them be accountable. He helps them with consistency. And he helps them make adjustments. Those three things are the key ingredients of any plan that works and the keys to working any plan. We, we read in Scripture today that... <clears throat> His plan was, and let me fill in a little bit more of the background, is to hold people accountable. He basically goes to people who had personal investments in the city and essentially says, hey, don't you own property in the city that backs up against the wall? Well, why don't you fix your place? And as you're fixing your place, you fix the wall too because your place backs into the wall and that would just help you. And everybody goes, that's a good idea. And, and, he, and, he, so, and he gathers resources and then he holds the noble folks accountable, some folks that have resources, financial and otherwise. Uh, and, he, and we'll talk about that in a couple weeks where he helps them do that. But he also holds them accountable. And some of them don't want to work because they feel like they're too good for it. And then as he continues to make the plan, it's not just a big idea that we're going to fix Jerusalem. But we're going to work every day. We're going to stay consistent. And yet he has problems. He has logistical issues he has to address. He has to do correspondence with other leaders in the area to let them know that he really is in charge, that the Babylonian king has allowed him to, or excuse me, the Persian king has uh, uh, allowed him to do this. Actually, it is the Babylonian king. Um, and then he, they're, they're threatened from outside. I mean, the, people are literally threatening their lives. And so he has to say, wait a minute. I mean, I know it's, this is hard work, and, and you, you've got your heart into it, but we've got to make some adjustments here. In fact, I wish everybody could just work nine to five, and, and we could do this all together, but the thing is we're going to have to split it up because half of y'all need to stay in guard, and the other half need to work, and we have to make these adjustments. And you know what? That's the key for all of us because that's the way life is. I don't care how great your goal is. I don't know how ambitious or grand or holy or perfect or wonderful Life is messy and gets in the way, and so we need, each of us, those three factors. Accountability, consistency, and adjustments. Accountability. Who have you told? Who have you told about your dreams? Who have you told what's most important? Who have you described, who have you talked to about 2019 and what you hope will happen in your marriage or with your health? or with your children, 
or your grandchildren? Who have you talked to to describe your spiritual journey about what your hopes are spiritually or, or how you might, time's running out that for your chance to raise up a new generation of, of Christians that would actually love God and really love neighbor, not just in word but in deed and honor God by how they treat other people. I mean, what's your plan? Have you, have you told anybody these things? Have you told? You have to. That's not, you know, and, and, and there's, not only do you tell other people, there's lots of other, you might want to write it down in a journal. There's lots of ways. I need to get in better health. And so uh, I've, I've, I've been in better health, and, and so it's, it's slid over the last year. And so I know I have to, uh, I have to go see the profit scale every so often. I go and see the profit scale, and the word of the Lord comes to me. <laughs> Thou hast not been faithful. <laughs> Thou hast been gluttonous and full of sloth. Right? It's, it's accountability. And we tend to run from accountability. That's why a lot of us don't see, go see the doctors or don't go to see the dentist or what, you know, because we, we're afraid of what we're going to see. But accountability is the part of every plan that works and working every plan. How do you need to stay accountable? I have a friend of mine that uh, shared with uh, on social media here recently his desire to quit smoking. And he was very vulnerable with all his friends. And it was really neat to watch how his friends comforted him and as he shared his needs and his desires and, and his struggles and how everybody got behind him and supported him and cheered him on. And he hasn't had a cigarette yet. And this has been weeks and weeks now. Who's holding you accountable? The next is consistency, right? We just got to keep at it. And this is both the, both the best news and the toughest news of all. Because the best news is, look, um, you know what? I'll just work at it every single day. And it's, it, you know, it, it, it's going to happen. And that's the worst news, too. It's not going to happen overnight. I didn't get into this place overnight. I'm not going to get out of it overnight. I just got to stay at it. I got to stay at it every single day because today is the day of salvation. I can't, I'm not promise tomorrow, can't do anything about yesterday. What can I do today? And it's putting whatever I do today against the next day and whatever I do that day and the next day. And those days become weeks and those weeks become months. You have helped me with this. Sometimes we are very unfair to ourselves, and when I came to this church, and you've been so encouraging, and, and you've said such nice things, but it's helped me realize how just doing what I have done, as best as I've done, has grown me. Because as you have affirmed some of the things that I've shared and do and this sort of thing, and I think to myself, well, I'm just being me, I realize, but I wasn't always like that. I've been working on this journey for a while now, a little bit every single day. So can you, which leads to that last part, because the way you work the plan every single day, and this may be the most practical step of all, you got to make adjustments. Here's the plan. you got to have plan A, which is the ideal. This is when everything goes right. You can go and put this, yep, uh, everything goes right. And then you got to have plan B, which is probably what's going to happen most of the time. And then plan C is well, let me at least do this. And this is really the key. This is really the key because um, we need an ideal. Just like on Friday, this last Friday, I had my first ideal study day since I moved here. I, you know, I, it was wonderful. I, I actually got a good, rich study day. And it's, it's, it's something that I would like to do every week. But that's just not the way life works. Now, if I didn't have an idea of what I wanted to do, I might have wasted that. So it's, you, you got to have an idea. What, if everything worked to plan, if, every, if you got everything you wanted, whatever you're talking about, restoring your marriage, growing in your faith, getting out of debt, losing weight, investing in your children, being the mom you've always wanted to be, whatever it is, what's the ideal plan of what you want to do every day? And then do plan B, because you know not every day is the ideal. And so you think, okay, well, if I can't do the ideal, I'd, I'd really like to do this. Maybe it's not everything I'd want, but I'd really like to do this. And then that's not enough. Because if you only stop there, and a lot of people stop there, and that's why they get discouraged. Because the truth is, 
an awful lot of days, what do you need? Plan C. It's just the truth. And plan C is, well, <laughs> what can I do? You know, people want to restore their marriage, and so they say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a much better marriage, and so we're going to go out on date night every week, and, and we're going to join this couple's thing at church, and, and we're going to pray together every single day, and, and we're going to eat meals together five times a week, and about three days into it, you're like, well, that ain't going to work. <laughs> but the thing is, it's a wonderful ideal, and you should write, because there might be a week or a day or a month where you get an awful lot of that eventually or maybe right away. But then you got to think about, well, what really is more realistic for us every day, every week? And then you got to think about, well, what could we do every day? Because, you know, life just kind of happens. I mean, some days you get up and it's like, man, I got up late and, you know, I, I don't feel good and I'm way behind at work and I'm not even sure I like my kids today. And, you know, what do you do on those days? And maybe in your marriage it's, you know what? We're going to pray together every day. If nothing else goes right, if nothing else goes to plan, at the very least, we're going to pray. And I would suggest that you pray together before you leave for work. Some people can't do that, and so you have to pick another time. But if I was married, that's what I would like to do, is every day pray for my spouse before she would leave or I would leave, and I have done this. But just take that moment. Say, hey, before you leave, God, please bless her today. Don't let her compare herself to anybody else. When she gets down, build her up. Help her know that she's loved and that she's way more good and beautiful than she thinks she is. And give you a chance to say, God, would you bless this man? Help him to know that he's way stronger than he thinks he is. Help him to know that he's our hero and I believe in him. Help him to be creative today and to forgive himself when he feels he's disappointed us or others. I'm telling you, that may be your C plan to just pray once a day. But I want you to imagine for a second two people that do that consistently. Maybe not even every day. Maybe they miss it sometimes. But if they did it four days a week over the period of weeks and months, do you think their marriage, they're going to feel like their marriage is better? More than likely they will. I mean, my devotions, I told you I had this great study day on Friday and I've got a B plan. But let me tell you about my C plan which happens a lot, a lot. Here's my C plan for spiritual growth. I wake up and I ask Jesus to into my heart because <laughs> I can always do that. And so whether I'm in the shower or I'm on the way to work, I have a prayer and I say, God, come into my life and come into my heart. Jesus, I want to live for you. Holy Spirit, work on me, in me, and through me that your kingdom, the kingdom that Jesus spoke about would come upon the earth. Use me and my relationships to do your will today. And then I, I go through about my daily five, which is five things that I'm thankful for. And I have a Bible verse on my phone that will show up. And I, sometimes I don't even get a chance to look at it first thing in the morning. I like to, but sometimes it's way in the afternoon before I even look at it. And that's my C plan for spiritual growth. And I'm a pastor. Do, do, do you understand what I just said? That was not all that deep. <laughs> and let's be honest, how often do you think I'm on my C plan? A lot. But it's something. It's something. It's not nothing. If you want to thrive in 2019, today is the day of salvation. Where are you running out of time? We're not promised tomorrow. What can you do today? Do something, anything today, and tomorrow you'll do the same. Have a plan, but not just one plan. Have an ideal. Sure, if things go perfect, this is what I want my life to look like. This is what I want to do. This is how I want to invest. This is what I want to change. And then here's my second plan when I don't have the ideal. Here's a lot of good stuff that I hope I can do. And then finally, if nothing else works, I'm going to at least do this. And I guarantee you, at this time next year, you may need some help with your friends to help remind you but you're going to feel different. You're going to feel like, yep, I made growth. I made progress. I didn't just survive. I moved further along where I wanted to be, where I felt things need to be more important, the most important. That's what I want for you as your pastor. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this message 
that's, again, it, it brings us sober thinking. Because we have such high hopes and, truthfully, such great needs to change, to be different, for our relationships to be different, to be better, for our lives to be better. And Lord, if we're counting on our circumstances to change, that's just not going to go well. Sometimes they do, but often they don't. Sometimes they even get worse. And so, Lord, we ask for your help to, to thrive anyway, to know and decide what's most important, to not be afraid to continually take inventory on what really needs to be the priorities in our lives and giving your Holy Spirit lots of room to work and then making a plan, a serious plan on how to get there, how to, how to make the most important thing the most important thing. And Lord, give us the wisdom then to, <laughs> to do the plans after that, to realize that probably most days won't be ideal and realize a lot of days it'll be, it'll be something if we do anything at all. But God, help us today, right now, today, understand to no longer waste, we don't want to no longer waste the day before us and give us the idea of what we can do, just something for our health to be better, to move out of the debt that is suffocating us, to move closer in the relationship we have with that loved one, that, that's, that spouse in our life, or that child, or those children, or the grandchild. Help us to move somehow each day out of a sense of a career and and into a calling, if that's where our heart is. Every day, God, help us to do something and trust you in the end for the results. In Jesus' name.